Hello and welcome to Wigton Book Festival and this event with Stuart Cosgrove, here to talk about his fantastic new non-fiction work, Cassie Sex. This is a book that focuses in on a single but significant year in the life of history's most famous boxer, Muhammad Ali, or Cassie's Clay, as he was at the time of this book. I'll be chairing today's event. My name is Alan Bett. I'm a literature officer at Creative Scotland and I was an arts journalist in a previous life. More importantly, let me introduce our author today. Stuart Cosgrove is a man with many strings to his bow. Amongst other things, he's written about music from a young age, initially a fanzine writer on the Northern Soul scene and later editor with NME. That love and knowledge of music has manifested itself into a recent trilogy, uh, a trilogy of prize winning books looking at soul and specifically at the scenes in Detroit, Memphis and Harlem. But those books were about more than just music, just as this book, Cassie's X, reaches out far beyond boxing and sport. It chronicles a very particular time and place and intersects music, politics, sport and broader culture. Standing at that intersection in Miami in 1963 is the man who would become one of the most titanic figures of the 20th century. And he would transcend all boundaries. Although at that time he was just an up upcoming, if not unassuming, heavyweight boxer. So we'll go on to discuss that man in that era with Stuart in a moment, uh, and hopefully we'll hear a short reading from the book. And then we can take some questions from you, the audience. First of all, let me thank all of those at Wigton Book Festival and the supporters of this event. Uh, and let me remind you that you can buy this book through the Wigton Book Festival website. And thank you all for uh, tuning in tonight. So Stuart, uh, hello and congratulations on the book. Well, thank you very much indeed, Alan. Very kind of you and thanks for the introduction. It's, uh, it's, it's always good to kind of hear uh, things uh, that you've done over your life and you can reflect back for moments in offices you've worked in, people you've met, uh, but actually writing the books has been a, a huge important part of my current life and, and it's just uh, great to be able to get them out there and people enjoy them. I a, a very simple question to start. Um, I mean, it is really a, a very individual take and a very specific take on Ali or, or Cassius as he was at that time. Can you start just by giving us a, a, a bit of a synopsis for those who might not be aware of your approach? Well, uh, you mentioned that it's um, in lots of ways a non-fiction book in as much as it draws on uh, quite a lot of the kind of strands and uh, moments uh, of the early 60s. Uh, we pick up the book really in the first days of 1963. Um, there's been a huge um, American football game, the Orange Bowl, that's uh, taken place in Miami. Uh, and the, the then president, John F. Kennedy, and, and his wife, Jackie Kennedy, have flown in for the game, but also to allow John F. Kennedy to have... Uh, dialogues and meetings with the Cuban emigres and exiles that had formed part of the notorious and, and catastrophic Bay of Pigs um, invasion. Uh, so it starts off in Miami. The reason why the Cuban emigres become important in the book is that some of the best boxers in the world are, are based in a gym on Fifth Street in Miami, which is run by Chris Dundee, the brother of Angelo Dundee, the manager of um, the then Cassius Marcellus Clay. Um, Cassius arrives from his hometown, Louisville, Kentucky, and the book, book really begins with his arrival against this context, but an awful lot of the themes that are being set up, uh, clearly his uh, ambition to become uh, heavyweight champion of the world, but also the fallout from the Bay of Pigs disaster, the assassination of Kennedy, the arrival also of um, a whole range of people that become influential in Cassius's life, not least uh, the uh, Sam Cooke, who uh, the soul um, musician and singer who becomes his kind of personal friend, uh, Malcolm X, uh, one of the charismatic leaders of the Nation of Islam, and all of these characters interweave throughout the book and their stories. Uh, so in lots of ways, it's uh, a biography of, the, of, of a single year in the life of Cassius X. And the book is called Cassius X because at the moment um, that we uh, meet him, he's already um, himself been uh, induced into the Nation of Islam by a local uh, 
uh, Islam uh, scholar called uh, Sam Saxon. Uh, he's attending the mosque every Friday and beginning the journey of his induction into the nation of Islam. One of the requirements of the nation's uh, philosophies is that you eliminate your slave name. And the way you eliminate that is by cancelling it out with the letter X, hence Malcolm X. Um, and Cassius makes the decision to do that, although his contracts require him to box under the name Cassius Clay. Uh, but he is, for the purposes of the year of the book, actually living personally under the name Cassius X. So it's Cassius X and a legend in the making. And, I mean, you mentioned that the book, of course... It reaches out far beyond sport, but of, but Muhammad Ali or, or Cassius is, of course, the, the, the focus of this book and the, the man at the intersection of all these characters and all these happenings. And, yeah. he, of course, he is such a documented, one of the most documented sports people, certainly, and individuals of the 20th century. What, what made you feel that you could shine a new light on, on this well, well, one of the things, without uh, putting kind of um, self-confidence aside, I'd had such a great reaction to the Soul Trilogy, and I was looking to uh, bring out a book that would actually enhance that um, range of books. And once you've said it's a trilogy, you can't say, oh, and here's the other one, that's number four. Um, so I started to look at ways, and I had in my mind that I might go back to the early 60s and look at the early days of soul, the first days of soul, uh, and I started to look at that. And as I looked at it, I became conscious with more and more research that Cassius was almost the, per the perfect witness to, mm. to that evolution of that new music. He was a big music fan. He was a record collector. Um, he, he knew and, 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 and had all sorts of personal relationships with soul singers for the period of the book he's dating and in love with uh, Dee Dee Sharp, who's a young soul singer from Philadelphia, who's a stable mate of the legendary Chubby Checker of the Twist fame. So there was this kind of other connection that he brought to uh, the early days of the music when it was, in many respects, uh, there was a kind of parting of the ways where hardcore R&B and dance craze music and all of these different kind of sub-genres of soul music were around. And, and so I used him really as a witness to all this, this change. But there was another thing that kind of spurred me into action. I remember a very early announcement that went out about me writing this book. And there was a guy, and I suspect he was from Edinburgh, but I couldn't be certain about that. This was on social media. And I have every reason to believe he was also a Hibernian football fan on the basis of his kind of profile. And he said, and I'm re ready for this, um, Oh, the last thing we need, another biography of Muhammad Ali, boring. And when I read that, I kind of felt a bit deflated, but I also realised that he was speaking a certain truth, that I had to find a way of writing a book that wasn't that, that differentiated itself from all that went in, in before. Uh, so in lots of ways, although it was one of these kind of snarky, insulting tweets that you get on Twitter, it gave me a momentum to do something very different, which I think the book does. Can I just say as a final thought on that uh, mysterious, and now I can't even remember the guy's name, so he remains an anonymous character, is he was doing a PhD on prison reform. And I did really want to go back to him and say, <laughs> oh, not another PhD on prison reform. Well, we had plenty of them before, you know. And, and you can get snarky like that on social media, but there was a side of me felt that he wasn't really giving this book a chance because he'd already pigeonholed it. And I was writing it and I knew it wasn't what he imagined it was. And the one thing that when you read the book, uh, it, although there is a biographical element to it, it's something more than a biography of, of, of Cassius. But I don't want to give him too much credit, this anonymous guy, but perhaps he gave you the, that was the, the challenge that you needed or? or... Well, well, I think in a sense, yes. And I think also, there's a point where you sometimes have to say, what is the point of difference? Because I think all writers at some stage in their life, they're faced with, oh, it's another one of those books, or, oh, it's romantic fiction. I know how that will be. Oh, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of, oh, it's a war novel. Haven't there been a lot of them? And all the time the writer is looking to differentiate 
their book or their writing or their skills or their storytelling from that which has preceded it. So I, I think the book, when people ask me, what is it? I think it's a hybrid. There's certainly definitely uh, biography in there. There's certainly social current and, and uh, affairs. There's certainly the story of um, race relations and civil rights. There's definitely a big chunk of it is the story of the evolution of soul music. So it's all of those things. It's not a biography of Muhammad Ali. And you called him just, you, you called him the perfect witness there just a few minutes ago. Yeah. But not the perfect man. And quite often now, I think any writing on Ali, it, it kind of veers into hagiography. Yeah. Um, and of course, he's a, that discredits him in a way because he's a far more real and complex character. Um, and we forget how much he was, he divided opinion and was hated in the 60s and the 70s. I mean, th this book is pre that exact period, but um, you obviously wanted to show more than one side. Of yeah, well, book. one of the challenges that I've faced throughout the trilogy and indeed in this book is that I think that all characters are complex. We all are in our lives. And I think if we reflected on ourselves, our family, the people nearest us, the people we love, children, whatever it is, you see in them a point of difference. You see in them the, the contradictions of character. And one of the things that I was struck by there, I remember um, writing Detroit 67, the opening book of the trilogy. And one of the central characters is the owner of the Motown Corporation, Barry Gordy. In every single book that I had written, uh, or rather every single book that I had read, this guy was portrayed as a kind of, you know, grasping, manipulative, um, serious kind of, you know, uh, character. He, he, he bought um, a mansion in Detroit and his own sisters commissioned this portrait of Napoleon to put on the uh, on the wall and it was their own brother way doing all the kind of Napoleon stuff and everything and it was it was a family joke but in every biography of this man that I read or every history of Motown there is a moment where he supposedly sacks Florence Ballard of the Supremes and every writer had this sacking going on where he would come down a flight of stairs past the Napoleon Bonaparte image and go down and cruelly get rid of this young woman and kick her out of the band. She was still in the band something like eight months after this supposedly had happened. And Mary Wilson uh, of the Supreme said to me, you know what, um, I'm not sure that that incident that supposedly happened even took place in that house because he hadn't yet concluded the deal on the house. So all of this stuff was made up to make this guy look like the most awful, you know, horrible person. So I started off that book thinking, I want to get inside the mind of Barry Gordy. He was, I spent 20 years at Channel 4 commissioning independent producers. And one thing I knew about independent television producers Whilst they were all a type in terms of the fact of the job they did, they were all deeply complex and often quite um, and quite something self kind of um, contradictory characters. And I just thought, right, I'm going to make Barry Gordy the greatest ever regional producer everywhere, anywhere. And I want him to be a hero of the book, not the villain of the book. Um, and so in some respects, going back to Cassius, I'm looking for characters that are complex, not simple. And we start off with this young man. He, he, he probably had what you would now classify as ADHD when he was at school. He was, he'd was he fallen behind his peer group. He was very, very, very um, easily distracted. He was always doing practical jokes. He was involved in all scams. He used to chase the school bus in the morning and try and beat the school bus from his home to his school. Uh, all of these things that would have him classified as a disruptive character and he was a pretty much a failure academically. And so how could that man turn out to be the significant iconic figure that he became? So I'm interested in those contradictions, not in the simplicity of following, uh, you know, a stereotype of a character. I mean, the, the other individual you do that, I mean, you do that with a number of individuals in the book, but one that really stood out for me was Sonny Liston. Yeah. He's always, always yeah. one dimensional wherever you read about him as a kind of brutish force of a man, quite based and un uneducated. And you 
to try and show something far more complex. And yeah, well, what, one of the things I wanted to do was I, I'd stumbled over a simple fact that he had an extremely high IQ, considerably higher IQ than, than Cassius did. That goes right against people's previous kind of readings of the man. You know, he was a bright guy. He was a very, almost quite a solitary figure, quite a socially awkward figure. Uh, and again, without... Uh, without going over the score and trying to, um, you know, uh, uh, try to kind of define him or confine him through kind of his uh, his challenges, he was much more of a character on the autism spectrum. He 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 was socially awkward. He didn't easily fit into company. He was a man who'd gone through a brutal time both in his upbringing and and then in his, in his uh, jail term. And as I was looking at these two men, I thought to myself, maybe think about doing that. Maybe think about one of them as being the autistic uh, champion of the heavyweight school, the other one being the ADHD newcomer. So I was kind of working with those images all the way through the book. Although, you know, being someone who's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm committed to um, a, a debate about fathers and the responsibility within the autism spectrum. So I tend not to diagnose and I didn't use that diagnostic terms within the writing of the book, but certainly in the research, I was trying to find evidence to stack up that interpretation. I mean, part of the reason that, I mean, boxers are simplified and they're made into stereotypes. And of course, Patterson and Liston were, were seen as opposites. Uh, I've got some really great quotes that Patterson was, Floyd Patterson was, a gentle gladiator, a, a martyr persecuted by the demons of his profession, but his list him is called a sinister creature. Yeah. And then Ali came in and he kind of confused that narrative, didn't he, that, that, that good, bad... Yeah, I think that the, the politics of civil rights in the early 60s had set up a very simple goody versus baddie narrative. And Floyd Patterson, who was the chosen champion of the NAACP, the National... Uh, uh, Association for the Advancement of Coloured People. He was the preferred boxer of John F. Kennedy. And Liston was the guy who'd been in prison. He'd been a, a, a street criminal. He had a horrendous bad record. And I think it was so easy to uh, stereotype them as the goody and the baddie of uh, African-American experience at that time to, to presume crudely that there were only two kinds of African Americans, the good guy and the criminal. I mean, if you tried that now, you'd be uh, quite rightly taken out and horsewhipped. But um, Muhammad Ali, or Cassius X as he was then, <coughs> uh, complicated that because it wasn't any longer a simple, bi simple binary. And he brought another set of issues into play, not least his conversion to, to Islam. Mm. I mean, we talked about duality, a character there, and a kind of duality in your book is, we, we talked about this earlier, you can read it in two different ways, either as a really in-depth non-fiction work, and I've tried that, and it's made me stop on about every page to reference some piece of information that you've, that you've kindly given us, and the other way is to read it as a, a really fast-paced novel, basically, yeah. fast-paced fast well, narrative. It's quite funny. I, I've been thinking that exactly. I've had three or four people come back to me, you know, on social media saying, just finish this in four hours. What a brilliant read. And I thought, right, they've, they've read it as a fast paced novel. And then other people would say, I had a guy uh, who works in um, a cafe that I have breakfast in, in Glasgow. And he said to me, oh, I've just got to the end of the first chapter. I've played every record you mentioned, and he's obviously going to take him six months to read it, you know? And I think I'm quite proud of that in a way because I, I want people to read it as a kind of page turner, but I also want people to see the depth and the kind of complexity within it as well and, and hopefully see the, uh, see the kind of depth and richness of the... Uh, the social and historical narrative of the times, you know? I mean, maybe that brings us to, you, you kind of agreed to, to give us a short reading that I think demonstrates the, the narrative quality of this book. Yeah, okay, so the way that I'll do that is each of the chapters takes place in a different city. The first chapter in Miami, the second chapter when uh, 
Cassius X meets Malcolm X is in Detroit at a Nation of Islam rally. And then the third uh, chapter is set in Philadelphia, where his girlfriend's from, and where there's an interesting kind of tension going on between a, a branch of the Philadelphia Mafia and a branch of the Philadelphia Nation of Islam for mm -hmm. effectively control over uh, Cassius's contract. He, by this time, has been managed by a group of businessmen from his hometown of Louisville, but that's coming towards the end. Uh, and uh, boxing has been going through a, a very dark period where it's been completely controlled by the mafia, of which the New York and Philadelphia mafia are the main drivers. So this is the Philadelphia chapter, the guy with the goods. It would be a long time before Blinky Palermo walked the streets of Philadelphia again. Each day, the squint-eyed convict shuffled along the 700-foot central corridor of the big house at Lewisburg's federal penitentiary. Palermo was in forced retirement, and his reign as one of boxing's biggest match fixers was all, fixers was all but over. He'd, he'd, been, he'd, been arrested, he'd been arrested for years on charges that included forgery, arson, impersonating a police officer, fraud, and larceny. He was not a violent man, but he knew people who were, and even in jail, an aura of weary threat still hung around him. Lewisburg was the incongruous home to some of America's most dangerous inmates. From the outside, it was an imposing, solemn building, more like a cathedral than a prison. And although its splendor was lost in some of its residents, the penitentiary was an architectural marvel based on the design of the 14th century Palazzo Publico in Siena. For Francisco Blinky Palermo, it resembled the Cathedral Basilica on 18th and Benjamin, or the local churches of his childhood in Philadelphia's south side. And as he, as he trudged to the vast prison can canteen, Palermo looked more like a clinically depressed Carmelite monk than a mafia villain. His most strenuous exercise was lying in his cell, reading dog-eared copies of the Ring magazine and conspiring to get messages back to the gyms, the bar rooms, and the pool halls of home. He'd grown up in Hain Street in Germantown in an Italian-American family, and throughout his childhood and adolescence, his mother, Angeline, worried about his sleepy and disfigured right eye, whilst his father, Sam, was more concerned about guiding him through the rituals of the family business and gaining the approval of Angelo Bruno, the man known by the epithet of the Gentle Dawn, who'd led the Philadelphia mob since 1959. Bruno was a criminal with a conciliatory bent and a clear model, moral code. He forbade the Philly Mafia from trafficking in heroin, preferring more traditional Cosa Nostra crimes, such as bookmaking, loan sharking, and fight fixing. It was in the fight game that Blinky Palermo flourished, serving his apprenticeship by fixing local bouts and finding street bums to take a dive against rising opposition. It was through this trade that he met his friend and criminal collaborator, Paolo Giovanni Frankie Carbo, a product of New York's Catholic reformatory system. Working in concert, often under the mafia codename The Combination, Carbo and Palermo manipulated the outcomes of hundreds of fights by intimidating promoters, beating up managers, and threatening boxers if they refused to go along with their fixers. Carbo's gentle voice and debilitating diabetes disguised a ruthless and pathological killer. He was a gunman for the Lucchese crime family and a member of the organized crime gang known as Murder Incorporated. So effectively, these uh, two mafia uh, fight fixers are both in jail, but we follow their story as they try to regain ground. Their last major con uh, contract from jail is their uh, shareholders in the contract of Sonny Liston, who is about to fight Cassius for the heavyweight champion of the world. What they like to do is to control both boxers so that effectively they had a cornerstone in the, uh, the category, in this case, the heavyweight championship. Uh, but of course, Cassius um, balked against that and was already very immersed in the Nation of Islam, who took over his, his contract and prevented the Mafia gaining control of his life. So it's, 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 these characters are fascinating in the sense that they are really, they, they do feel like they're from some, some uh, Mafia movie or something like that. And I kind of liked 
putting the guy in a jail that was more like a monastery. There was something kind of intriguing about that. So th those sort of sections do certainly feel more novelistic, uh, although they're based all in fact. It seems whether, whether you are writing about sport or music, it's the behind-the-scenes characters that interest you more. Um, yeah. And we quite often seem more interesting than those on stage or in the ring. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think the other thing is that um, uh, my publisher says to me, sometimes I see you're loving going down rabbit holes. And that's kind of one of the things I really love when you find a character um, who maybe has... I mean, there's a, a story in um, the latter part of Detroit where um, some police officers are up on charge of murdering a young black guy. And um, the, the judge who's, who's presiding over the trial, I mean, I could have written a novel on the judge alone, and you know you've maybe got a couple of hundred uh, words to put him in context, but this guy was living a double life. He had 17 children, and it was just extraordinary. And the more I researched the judge, I thought, you have to stop now. You've got the words you need. Stay with the big story. Don't get too far down the rabbit hole. Another, we've talked about the individuals. Another character, sounds kind of trite, but another character is the place. It is Miami. Yes. I mean, I know you take a sojourn to London and, and for the, the Henry Cooper fight, but it's mostly Miami. The, the, and this leads to a question, yeah. a question that's just come in from the audience as well. Uh, how, did you, how did you build that character? And can you tell us a little bit more about Miami at, at that time? Well, well, basically, Miami is one, one of the central characters in the book, probably after Cassius, the central character. Uh, I, and in a way, what, what, I, what I like doing is I like trying to get a feel for the place at the time, and I immerse myself. I do a lot of reading. Now, uh, you can kind of obviously do stuff online that's factual, that's based on the city and its kind of history. But, you know, I, I, like, I like going back into, into books that have been fictions that have been set in the place, get a real uh, feel for it. And I, I was very fortunate in that the great uh, American uh, writer, Joan Didion, had written a book um, about Miami that I just kind of immersed myself in. And mm. every little kind of metaphor that she used, I'd write it down and think, well, you know, how am I going to expand on that? Or how am I going to use that? And, and um, she'd actually talked, if you look at the shape of Florida, it's almost like the, the barrel of a gun. It's almost like a pistol pointing down into the Gulf of Mexico. And she talked about that as an image. And so you think, well, that's too good not to use in some form or another. But because I'm... Uh, a great kind of, I'm a great kind of collaborator. I always quote from the people directly rather than just use their stuff and pretend it's mine. So, it, you know, so I'd say in her, you know, um, in her kind of multi award winning book, Miami, Joan Didion claims, and then da da da. Um, and in the process of doing that, there's deep reading, there's deep research. And then there's just simply a bit of imagination, you know? And so, for example, if you find an area of Miami and there were plenty of them that were down at heel, you know, you're on the main drag and it's all a bit splendid, two back, it's starting to get a bit scuzzy and a bit, that's the same Atlantic City, same as Las Vegas. You start to get that feeling that um, that's kind of, it's all a little bit kind of grubby. And I love kind of writing about that part of it, the rusting, the slightly falling apart. Um, and um, I think, in fact, the first chapter is Miami, where neon goes to die. And I'd use that quote as a kind of way of saying there's something slightly faded and, and kind of almost pathological about it as well. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge boxing fan, so I, I love this book. I was, I was absolutely satisfied as a boxing fan. Um, of course, it has so much more. And I wondered, did you come at it as a fan of boxing or a fan of music? Because music. Uh, probably a fan of music, first and foremost, but I was a boxing fan. And curiously enough, I think I'm maybe not alone in this. Maybe it's a generational thing. Maybe it's just simply the way it is. But Cassius, Sonny Liston, uh, and then all the way through to Joe Frazier and uh, Foreman and all of these great uh, boxers, they were at a period of time when 
heavyweight boxing was at its absolute prime. There hadn't been the same fragmentation of um, associations. There hadn't been the same idea that managers would play off different kind of uh, belts and titles against each other. So you had a real clarity about who was the heavyweight champion of the world. You could name them. You could go through them. You know, um, Patterson, Liston, Cassius Clay, and all the way up to him being stripped of his title. And that kind of great period of boxing fascinates me endlessly. I'm slightly less fascinated now for the very simple reason. I'll give you an example. The other night, Josh Taylor won his fight. And I was pleased for Scotland that we had a champion that had done well. But that was it. There's no way that I could in ever way get excited about the guy he was boxing or the guy he might box next. Whereas when it was Cassie's era, I'd keep little notebooks. I kind of knew their name. I knew where they were from. Somebody said to me, George Chivalo. I'd know who he was. And I just didn't feel that about boxing now. So I've maybe fallen out of love with it or maybe boxing when it was taken off mainstream TV and became pay-per-view didn't matter too much as much to me. A little bit like that's happened to football actually too. So um, I like boxing, but I like the culture of boxing more than actually people beating each other up. Hmm. And music, as I say, I mean, you've actually got a playlist in the book. Um, yes. And, I mean, you mentioned Night Train and, and music oozes out the book in, in, in every chapter. Um, an audience question has come in that, that links to that. Um, and they mentioned an, an iconic image is Ali Shuffle. In your mind, what song is playing in his head as he performs that? Well, that's a very, very good question, that, because um, there is actually, there, there is a, a funk dance record simply called the Ali Shuffle. So I would like to think it was that, but I'd also found a story that um, when he, 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 Cassius X wouldn't fly. He had a real passionate fear of flying. Um, and so he tended to be on trains most of the time. And I read a story by a journalist that said he got on a train in Los Angeles and took it all the way back to Louisville, where he was from, and danced to Chubby Checkers the Twist all the way. And that's that kind of slightly mad ADHD part of him. So I suspect there's a little bit of him that would have been dancing to the twist or maybe uh, do the alley shuffle. But the one thing I do know was that Sonny Liston's signature tune, Night Train, um, both the James Brown version that came out in the early 60s and the previous version that had been out in St. Louis when he was a, a young guy growing up, that was his signature tune. And that piece of music scared the living daylights out of Cassius. He just saw it as listen and he saw it as fearful, as intimidating, and as kind of almost sort of pathological. And, and I, I just love the idea that Liston's music spooked him. You, you alluded to the name change in, uh, it, in your opener. I mean, the book's called A Legend in the Making. It does feel like a man that I kind of chrysalis is still to come out the, the other side as something new. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, he's called Cassius here, and I always feel bad about calling him that because, of course, he tormented other fighters who who misnamed him. Um, can you talk a little about that name change? And uh, yeah, I mean, he, he had a he had a big big fight with um, Ernie Terrell when they fought each other in Chicago '67, I think it was, and Ernie Terrell um, was was probably one of the best of the Northwestern heavyweight boxer. He was the brother of Gene Terrell of the Supremes. So um, Ernie Terrell uh, was the preferred boxer of Motown. Most of the kind of Motown uh, musicians knew Ernie and knew him really well. And in actual fact, it was his name that gave um, birth to Tammy Terrell, who, whose, whose real name was Tammy Montgomery. And when they changed, when Motown suggested she change her name to Terrell, they took it from Ernie Terrell, who was by then the heavyweight champion of the city of Chicago and probably number three or four in the heavyweight rankings. And he was the one that mistakenly, I think in a press conference, referred to Muhammad Ali as Cassius and that Cassius Clay. And that wound up, um, that wound up Cassius. And that's when he, when he was beating on me, he started shouting, what's my name, what's my name, what's my name? 
But their key issue wasn't actually the name Cassius, which is his first name because Malcolm X's first name was Malcolm. So the issue was the second name, the slave name, the name you inherited from a slave owner. He didn't really inherit his first name, Cassius, from a slave owner. That was uh, a name that his mother and father gave him, although it happened to be the same name as ancestrally uh, the guy who was his slave owner, who was the original Cassius Marcellus Clay. Now, interestingly enough, and you, you read about this in the second chapter, he, when he first met with the Nation of Islam, they talked him through how he would have to eliminate his second name. And he had a big, big anxiety about that. And the main anxiety was that his original slave owner, Cassius Marcellus Clay, was probably the most famous slave emancipator in, in Kentucky. He, he had, he had uh, alternative press, he ran books, he ran rallies, he spoke on behalf of emancipation, he was against slavery, he freed all of his own slaves. And so in Kentucky, Cassius has inherited the name of someone who you could feel a degree of pride in, if you like. And he argued with the Nation of Islam, saying, Look, I, don't, I don't want to give up my name. It's my name. I'm proud of my name. I, you know, I understand his story. He was not the bad guy. You know, and they said, no, no, no. He was still the slave owner. Cancel your name. And so when he took on the name X, it was cancellation. And then, of course, when he became heavyweight champion of the world um, and he passed through the induction of Nation of Islam, you're, you're given what's known as a given name, the name that the Nation of Islam gives you, in his case, Muhammad Ali. Uh, so although he didn't really, although he, you know, he, he, he would argue against people after he became Muhammad Ali, during the period of this book, he was immensely proud of the name Cassius. And, and he took X on because that was a requirement of the religion that he was uh, following. I mean, the name, of course, had real moral and religious weight and significance that that change but there was that other duality in him that, i mean the real the real ali and the the image he portrayed and he he knew before many others that the idea that you had to create a persona where, where, whether people loved it or hated it he needed the eyes of the world on him and yeah. you, you you talk about his process there i mean was that something he came up with individually or, or do you think that was influenced by others I think he took influence from all sorts of different kind of uh, people or places and, and things. Mm -hmm. The one thing that stands out, Alan, that, that, that I must say I sort of kind of understood but didn't really till I started to research the book, is here was a young man with an absolutely visionary understanding of how the media worked. I mean, way, way, way beyond anything that we would now say about, oh, you know, people say things like, oh, he's very media savvy and, oh, he's an Instagram influencer and all that stuff. Muhammad Ali, or Cassius X for this book, was growing up at a time when the main way of communicating was through magazines. So the big magazines in America, Life magazine, Time magazine, the big sporting ones, Sports Illustrated, he realized that to actually build an image and build a reputation, that he had to get on the cover of these, of these magazines. That was what would make you a household name, more even than, than television, which was still in its infancy. And he started to work on the idea that in order to do that, he had to build up personal friendships and relationships with photographers. So the, the one that you first meet in the book, you meet a lot of photographers in the book, but the one you first meet is a young man called Flip Shulk. He's a Miami freelance photographer who is uh, sent by Life magazine uh, to, um, to photograph Cassius. And Cassius sits down with him and says, Flip, tell me how you get a cover. How do you, as a photographer, get a cover? Or how do you get a double page spread? So he had all of this kind of language that he was using. And Flip Shulk said to him, you know what? I, I don't really know the answer to that because I've only ever had one cover in my life. And that was on Life magazine where I did an underwater photography thing. It was actually with Jacques Cousteau, the underwater um, uh, explorer. And Cassius immediately said, that's interesting. I train underwater. Now that was not, not only untrue. It was a complete lie. And furthermore, Cassius couldn't even swim. But he stayed out in a motel in Overtown in Miami 
which was a, a I'll not go off on a, a deviation here, but it was the home of the greatest soul club in Miami, the Sir John Mattel, it was called. And um, he, he, he had a room, Cassie's had a room just outside the soul club. How cool is that, right? Next to the swimming pool. And uh, the photographer comes the next day with the scuba gear and Cassie's goes into the pool and does a full training session, dunk, dunking underwater with a the photographer there. And to this day, they're some of the most stunning boxing images you've ever seen in your life, shot underwater. And he did that with every single photographer. There's one great kind of uh, story about him that I really love was that he, when he was traveling anywhere, he would get a piece of what we'd now call gaffer tape and put the gaffer tape in his pocket. And if a photographer looked like he was struggling for an idea that might get Cassius a bigger spread or a cover or whatever, he'd rip two bits of the gaffer tape to make an X and put it over his mouth like that, almost to say, shut him up, right? Because he's always talking. But it also created the X of Cassius X. And it was just a stunningly smart photographic idea, simple and effective. And he kept the, the gaffer tape in his pocket in case the photographer didn't have an idea. You know, if they did have an idea, he went with it. I mean, there's one photograph which I really love. When he was at school, 16, 17 year old, before he'd won his um, Olympic uh, gold boxing medal in Rome in 58, his, his job was he worked in a library in a convent. And he told this once to a photographer who was going to hook up with him in Louisville um, for a photo session. And the guy said to him, what, a convent with nuns? Cassius said, yeah, 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 the nuns love me. So the photographer turns up at this convent, and sure enough, here's these 20 kind of nuns in the full black and white kind of regalia, all crowded around one young African-American man, making the most stunning kind of photographic image you could ever imagine. And that was the sort of stuff that separated him from Liston and from Patterson and from Ernie Terrell and all of these other great boxers that didn't have the same understanding of how the media worked. But what was different about him then? I mean, this was an era where especially black athletes kind of had to defer to white American sensibilities. And what was different about Cassie at that time, Ali, which gave him the confidence to say that he was unwilling to be stereotyped in the way that we said that boxers and others. Well, I think he, from, from the outset, there was clearly a supreme confidence that his speed in the ring would make him a very, very, very difficult opponent. So I think he knew he could go up the rankings. And one of the reasons he moved to Miami was to be with Angelo Dundee, who was one of the great boxing managers and, and promoters of that time. And the fact that Chris Dundee was a promoter and Angelo was a manager, they would selectively choose people that they knew Cassius could beat so that they could arrange his way up the rankings to eventually number two and then uh, the heavyweight champion of the world when he defeated Liston. So I think there was a natural, in his mind, understanding that he was good. Mm -hmm. uh, and being good and being very good was the next kind of part of his, um, uh, of his mission. But, you know, there's a, another interesting thing as well about Cassius that, that kind of, again, makes you think of him slightly differently. Because he was graduating towards the Nation of Islam uh, and towards their teachings, and to be honest, you know, if you look at them now, they're an early black power organization. They believe in racial segregation. They were, uh, they were an outlier organization, albeit very successful within the prison system, within the... Uh, big urban centres, the Chicago, Detroit, etc. And once Cassius had begun the journey of um, conversion, by his nature, he had to place himself in difference, if not in opposition, to Martin Luther King and King's movement. Now, King's movement, the um, Southern Christian uh, Leadership Coalition, was predicated on uh, the idea of peaceful cooperation of trying to win civil rights progress through peaceful means, through demonstrations, through sit-ins, through boycotts, but never through the res resorting to violence. Cassius never really, really bought into that. And I remember there's a conversation that I remember it was with his own father and I'd managed to find the 
transcripts of it where he says something like, I like Dr. King, I respect him, but he teaches me to turn the other cheek. I will never, ever turn the other cheek against a racist. So in other words, he had that kind of thing that was kind of quite central to the nation of Islam. We will stand up for ourselves physically. We will not be bullied. We will not be beaten. We will not be cowered. And I think that gave him another inner strength. I mean, he's a really good boxer, but to have that kind of inner strength and to be surrounded by, let's put this into Scottish kind of uh, street culture, to be surrounded by some of the tastiest guys you've ever seen if it came to a fight. Cassius was not absolutely going to take second uh, string to anyone. I mean, with, with that context in mind, w were you always sensitive to the links between this story and the current happenings with Black Lives Matter, take, take a knee in the way that black sports people are treated to this day? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you go back over the, um, the trilogy... The um, execution of the three young black men at the Algiers Mattel in uh, the July of 1967 and jump forward to uh, the, uh, the execution of a young man called Michael Payne in Memphis the week before Martin Luther King's assassinated. He's killed by a police officer from the Memphis police force. And then if you jump forward again, uh, to uh, the killings uh, or, or the incarceration of some of the Black Panthers in um, Harlem, you begin to see even in the trilogy that this idea of uh, that, that Black Lives Matter is, of course, a movement of our time. But so many people say to me that question, you know, that feel, a lot of people say to me, I'm reading the book and I just think that this is Black Lives Matter. I just feel the present tense saturating the books. And I, I, I'm proud of that because I think that I wanted them to not be dead history. I wanted them to be history that was alive. I'm working on another book and I'm just doing a, uh, I'll, I'll not go into the detail of it, but I'm just working on a chapter just now that involves a young man that's killed in Augusta, Georgia. And again, this is 1966, something like that. And you just think, this is Black Lives Matter. It's the same story, you know. So I like actually allowing the reader to feel that contemporaneity uh, through it, you know, whether it's about talking about him being brilliant with the media or whether it's about him refusing to give in to racism. I like those kind of modern things to filter, even although it's a historic book. Um, actually, I've got a couple of questions coming in. Um, somebody actually does want a, another addition to your soul trilogy. They, they want a fourth. They are asking about whether you'd consider Philadelphia in the 70s. So it could be Philly. I, I would, yes. And that, that was actually a front runner as the possibility. One of, one of the reasons that I've not got it yet is I've not nailed the exact day, the exact year, rather. So whether that would be 75, 76, 77, and I have to do more research, but there has to be within the city significant other events going on other than just great music. But that would be a natural um, uh, that would be a natural follow up to it. Um, and I am considering that. Yes. And another question is about rather than place about characters, are, are there any characters who you, you've discovered through your research who you could who could be the focal point of another book? Uh, they've uh, mentioned yes. Alberta um, Odell Jones. Yeah, I'm working on uh, a number of uh, different uh, characters who I'm quite intrigued by, without going into the detail to it, because I've signed a kind of one of these, you know, non-disclosure agreements with um, a development company for Netflix just now. And basically what it is, is there's a story uh, about a character who appears in the Memphis book, uh, who, who, who goes under the code name Agent 500. And he's a Vietnam vet who's returned back to America and is under the control of military intelligence because he may have been involved in war crimes in Vietnam, a bit like the Mille Massacre, but the year later. And, you know, the military intelligence have got control over this man's life. 
Um, and it's a fascinating, fascinating story. It's not really a story that's necessarily set in a city, uh, but it's about a character who, for very, very complex reasons, is engaged in doing things where he's, to some extent, he's not in control of his own actions because others are controlling him. And I find that a compelling area. So I'm, I'm working on three or four things just now that are fall into that category. I would like to ask, uh, I mean, you said that boxing wasn't your, it's not a, a book which is absolutely about boxing, but what attracts writers to boxing? I mean, the the Ali doc, uh, documentary, Leon Gast's film, When We Were Kings, you have Norman Mailer, George Plimpton pop up as talking heads. Um, our, our very own Hugh McIlvany, I think, wrote more eloquently than anyone about such a brutal sport. But there seems to be a real attraction between these kind of diametrically opposite arts. Do, do you have yeah. any thoughts on that? I mean, I think that, you know, you're right about the kind of the new journalists and uh, there are many, many great, particularly in America, actually, many great writers that have used boxing as, as a kind of source area. I think the simple answer is there's lots and lots of explanations, one of which we talked about earlier, which is this sort of primal sense of rivalry between different characters who can be given or can be ascribed different values, the way that Patterson and Liston and then Cassius were. I think the other thing about it is that particularly filmmakers, um, they love the world of the gym with the skipping, the, 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 you know, the, the bags, the posters, the, the ring, the sawdust, the sense of kind of canvas, the claustrophobia of it all. I think there's an awful lot of um, people like that as a film environment. Uh, and then the other thing about it is that boxing, great boxing uh, fixtures, are often morality tales. You know, they are tales of good versus evil or the, the, the little guy against the champion. And there is no greater kind of morality tale than, say, talking of Philadelphia than, than, than Rocky, which is the ultimate idea of a morality tale. And I think that's appealing to writers, to filmmakers, to script writers. Um, and I think that's one, there are many more reasons for that, but that would certainly be one of them. I was wondering if it was voyeurism as well. It's a bit of, it's, it's so far removed from, from your own art, is it? Just such yeah. a look into another world or something that you, a writer would potentially be unable to do. It's, it's that. Yeah, and also that there's a way where, I mean, it's quite an intense world as well. And I think for, I think writers um, like to kind of also, you know, boxing, I don't have many to, to hand, but boxing's also full of kind of metaphors, taking a dive, being in the ring, the bell, you know, all of these things that are actually quite nice to write about because you can get, yeah, it was actually, um, I think it was Michael Varney that was talking about the death of the young uh, Johnny Welsh boxer that died. What was he doing? Johnny Owens. Yeah, you Johnny Owens, yeah. Uh, and he made, he made the fascinating observation that it was Johnny Owen's tragedy that he'd grown up in, he'd grown up to be articulate in the most kind of brutal language in the world, you know. And, and I found that line, isn't it? a moving thing, that it was one of these things that kind of nailed the sense of artistry and pathology at the same time, you know. I was wondering about your approach to writing nonfiction and whether, as a collector of Northern Soul records, if that fanaticism feeds into your uh, fanaticism for, for facts, if there's some... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you've got me. I, I confess I am that nerd. And I, and I think there is a side of me that does have that characteristic of, um, uh, of listing, of controlling, of trying to understand things by their numbers. And, you know, it's, it's a, a, a not uncommon trait. But one other thing about the Northern Soul scene... <clears throat> when I was um, uh, a fanzine writer in the scene, there was no internet, you know, so you were at a loss and, and there was no cheap flights to America. Working class kids didn't go to America, but you had this love affair with African-American music, which you were seeing through imports and they were, by their nature, they were absolutely majestic to look at, to 
dwell on. And I used to go down to libraries. I was living in Manchester at the time. I'd go down to the public library and try and find out um, things like... I, I remember once being at uh, one of the big cl clubs. It was, um, uh, it was um, just before Wigan had opened, and it was in Manchester. And it was downstairs in this uh, basement club. And I remember being there, and I was at the DJ stand, and I was watching the record going round. And I was trying to read the record, the title, and I would put it in my notebook and try and say, right, well, I know what that is now. I'll try and find it, even although they were dead rare and you couldn't always find them. But I started to work out <coughs> that the, the record would often have a phone number, a zip code. Mm -hmm. So brackets, the zip code, the, the dialing code, then the phone number. And I'd worked out that 313... Just those three numbers, 313, was the dialing code of Detroit. So any time I looked on a record and I saw 313, I thought, Detroit record. And I could do the same with Baltimore, Philadelphia, New Orleans. And I, I built up my knowledge of Northern Soul through those kinds of, those, those kinds of things, you know. Um, and, you know, records that are rare or records that are unavailable become almost like a holy grail to you, looking to check them down. Uh, I've just been sent something actually on Facebook before we come on air, and it's a record on King Records, which is called Cincinnati uh, Top Independent King Records. It was uh, the label that James Brown was on for part of his career. And this record's by a young man called Junior McCants, and it's one of the kind of rarest records on the Northern Soul scene. And I know that it's a DJ in, in Leeds that has the record. But one of the reasons it became so rare is that this young singer, Junior McCants, had caught uh, bone cancer at a very early age. He was only in his early 20s and died. And so as a courtesy to the family, they withdrew the record. Um, and therefore, only two or three versions of the record got out, went to radio stations, and those two or three filtered into the market. And one thing's sure, they're going to end up in somewhere like Leeds on the Northern Soul scene. And I love those kind of stories that go with it as well. So I love the kind of intrigue behind uh, record collecting. I think we've answered all our audience questions, but I have one last question for you before we wrap up. And we've talked about the, the, the book feeling very much like a novel and having a narrative flow, but it's also very visual and cinematic. Are, are there any yeah. plans to take it to screen either in as a documentary or as feature? Uh, this particular book has already been optioned by a film company. And my understanding of it, I, I, I need to kind of go and check this uh, later this week, but I think it's already been bought by the Smithsonian uh, Channel in America, as I understand it. And that will be, I don't know what if they sold it as a three-parter or a two-parter or quite what, but they're seeing it as kind of documentary. Um, but the trilogy has been bought um, by another New York company. Again, more documentary skewing. But one element of the book has also been bought by a fiction company. Um, and that's uh, something that's kind of aimed more at the US streaming companies, Amazon and uh, Netflix, etc. So, yeah, the, 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 they're already doing well in that respect and seem to be selling well as well, which is nice. Are those treatments that you'd write for the screen at all or, or leave it to... Yeah, yeah, I, I actually get asked to do quite a bit of that. And, you know, during lot, the first couple of weeks of lockdown, when everybody's panicking, I kept getting these requests. Would I write this? Would I do that? And the money's quite good if you're writing um, the treatments for movies or for um, storylines, for documentaries or for um, pictures. Um, and they want to buy you out. So they just kind of say, like, two grand writers list, so you go and write it and you get the money. Um, that happened quite a lot because a lot of companies panicked because their, their production was being closed down and they needed to imagine that they'd have a life outside the other side of the pandemic. And so they were putting a lot into development. So they were spending money on development and commissioning writers that had a name or a reputation. And so I, I got quite a lot of that. It's still around. I'm still getting bits and pieces but actually the hardest days of the lockdown were lucrative in that respect. Thanks very much, Stuart. Um, that actually brings us to the end of the session. Um, 
our, our time is up, but let me take this opportunity again to say thank you to everyone at Wickton Book Festival and all the sponsors and supporters of the festival. And to remind everyone out there that this event is, of course, free, but there is a, an option to donate to the festival on the website. And, of course, you can go on the website and buy this fantastic book with such a striking cover, and I'd absolutely recommend that you do. Um, all I'm left Very to say is a huge, a huge thank you, you Stuart, uh, not only for informing us and entertaining us with this conversation today, but for writing this book. Um, as I say, it was, it was a, a revelation for, for me to read. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Alan. And a real pleasure. And thanks for giving me your time and support as well. And thanks to everybody that's taken the time to log on tonight. I know it's a slightly kind of less, you know, exciting way of doing it, of sitting in front of computers. But we are where we are. And hopefully when we come out the other end of this, I'll get a chance to come back to Wigtown next year. Thank you.